Morning all, I'd like to show you what I think is actually a historically important game as it turns out. The game was played in the New York USA Championship of 1969. This is not the Open Championship but rather the more exclusive All Play All Championship which was a qualifier event for the World Championship Interzonal Tournament at the time. Pal Benko was playing black against Karl Berger. Pal Benko, Hungarian, born July 14th, 1928, is celebrating something like his 85th birthday at the moment. So he's still around. He's a chess grandmaster, author and composer of Endgame Studies and Chess Problems. There are currently two excellent articles at Chessbase about him, which I'll put as links in the description. I think most of us know Pal Benko from his Benko Gambit. So D4, the Benko Gambit. Knight F6, C4, C5, and White plays D5, and the Benko Gambit is B5. Apparently, he didn't want to learn opening theory. He detested, in fact, learning opening theory and conceived this system as a way of kind of bypassing it. But uh, in this game, okay, Cole Berger, in round 12, the final round of the New York exclusive USA Championship of 1969, which was an all play all, who was Cole Berger, his opponent? Cole Berger was an international master with two GM norms and unfortunately he ended up taking last place in this US Championship with four draws and seven losses. He was a medical doctor and former teacher, chess teacher to Bobby Fisher actually at the Manhattan Chess Club. He played chess in over 20 countries and 47 of the 50 states. In 1993 he won the Georgia State Championship. Returning again to Pal Benko though, so Pal Benko's known for this Benko gambit and he is also a very very strong player who was playing in the 1959 candidates tournaments which we featured heavily in recent days on this channel. Uh, he actually played of course Fisher four times in that 1959 encounter. So, okay, let's see. He was born uh, in Amiens, France, raised in Hungary. He was Hungarian champion by the age of 20. He emigrated to the United States in 1958 after defecting following the World Student Ch Team Championship in Reykjavik, Iceland in 1957. Fide awarded him the Grandmaster title in 1958. So his highest achievement was qualifying and competing in the Candidates Tournament, the tournament to decide the challenger for the World Championship in 1959 and 1962. So both of these tournaments had the world's top players. He finished 8th in 1959 and 6th in 1962. But he had qualified for the 1970 Interzonal Tournament. And this game I want to show you now is the last game of the US Championship which let him qualify for the 1970 Interzonal Tournament. So let's see. His opponent wasn't very sporting and didn't allow him to play his famous Benko Gambit. His opponent played the turgid E3. So Pal Benko as black played G6, Knight F3, Fincher to the Bishop, Bishop E2. His opponent is in fact determined to play as solidly and boringly as possible. C takes D4, E takes D4, D5. But nevertheless we have some excitement coming up soon as there's going to be an isolated Queen's Pawn. So after Knight C3 both sides castle Knight C6. Karl Berger plays H3 and this allows black to inflict on white the isolated Queen's Pawn. D takes C4. Bishop takes c4. So there are some perks, of course, for the isolated queen's pawn. Outpost squares, pressure on the e file, 
potential king safety issues if a knight's perched on e5. It's up to black to try and neutralize all the perks, maybe set up a blockade on d5. And often we say that you know the weaknesses around the isolated queen's pawn are a problem in the end game. But also in the middle game, across this diagonal, there might be some issues. So let's see. In fact, black's next move, b6, highlights the latter. From from Black's perspective, this diagonal could be quite useful against White's king as well, let alone trying to positionally blockade the isolated queen's pawn. White plays a3, so he's got avoidance of knight b4s if he wants to um, put his bishop say on a2 or d3. Here, it's more uh, of a str uh, of a strong fortress around the king because usually in the isolated queen's pawn situation, you'd have a nice diagonal with um, more convenient targets, but here it seems quite solid for black's king's safety. Black now played e6, which looks as though, okay, it's weakening some more dark squares. Bishop g5, h6, bishop f4, bishop b7. And so it looks as though black's fianchetto bishops look good in this position. The isolated queen's pawn doesn't seem a major threat. Any d5, it seems, can be answered with knight a5 anyway. The breaks have been put on the isolated queen's pawn. The bishop might even be a target here on f4. This bishop on c4 gets out of the way of knight a5s. Okay, and we see knight e7, which looks as though it's either gonna set up a blockade on d5 or it's gonna come to f5 just to threaten this d4 pawn if there's threats like bishop takes f3 and knight takes d4. So against this maybe, uh, Bishop e5 is played. We see knight f5. Is black fretting anything concrete at the moment? It just looks like a very comfortable position. Rook c8. And maybe there is an option of taking, although there might be some downside to that here, actually. So, but in any case, it does seem like it, it is a relevant threat. Bishop takes and knight takes d4. And white plays a very passive looking move actually. Perhaps over overemphasizing that threat. He plays knight h2, very passive. Rook c8. We see here black's got a beautiful position. The isolated queen's pawn just seems to have no perks actually in this particular position. Perkless. Rook c1, queen d7. Black's just building up the pressure, in fact, on that poor IQP. Queen d3, rook fd8. White's clinging on with rook fd1. But now, I mean, this bishop on e5 is a guardian, actually, of dark squares. Here, with a pawn on h3, if black can establish a knight on f4, without it being chopped off, then it's difficult to evict a knight on f4 in this position. And g frees there's knight h3. So that would be particularly painful to establish a knight on f4. So instead of going for the isolated queen's pawn blockade with knight d5, we see more aggressive knight h5, just trying to perch a knight on f4. Queen e2, and white's position is rapidly deteriorating here. It seems, in fact, it's almost immediately a very strong move, just threatening mate for no engine point of view, queen c6. What does white do about this? Does he sacrifice a pawn? It doesn't seem that sound. But this, this wasn't played. In fact, you know, there's d4 here and there's still trouble for white. So black has an exceptionally pleasant position but doesn't go for queen c6, he goes for bishop takes e5. Which appears okay, technically it's not as strong, but still white went slightly wrong here, it seems. White took with the pawn, and if you're taken with the queen, this stops at least knight f4. Okay. And white has to be willing to sack the d-pawn, of course, but then knight g4. And it's not all over that quickly. For example, like this. There's still 
a game to be played. But uh, no, white didn't do this. White played d takes e5. And now black uses the queen c6 idea to threaten mate. White takes on d8, rook takes d8, and very passively plays queen f1. So, so far, this looks like a completely disastrous isolated queen's pawn game for white based on his king safety and this diagonal. He never got any of the perks going that you would normally have. And in fact, black's pieces are all over his king now after knight f4. There's even a threat of knight takes h3 check here. G takes queen h1 mate. So white has to parry that. And again, knight takes h3 probably doesn't it just win a pawn? I guess white would have to play king h2 and it's very, very unpleasant. But um, another strong move, knight d4 is played. Just trying to uh, get rid of white's defences a bit more. White took on d4. Rook takes d4, still with frets of knight takes h3 check, for example. But there's also another threat in this position because it's not just the knight and bishop helping the queen, or rather, it's both the knight and bishop helping the queen, which means that this mate threat is quite pertinent, which means also there's another amazing resource in the position, which makes itself apparent after rook d1. Black just takes this, knight takes d1, and instead of the obvious knight takes h3 check, which is uh, better for black, of course, as well, white doesn't want to be mated like this. But there's an even stronger move here, and I wonder if you can guess it. So this move may be, in fact, of great historical importance, triggering Pal Benko to come third in the New York USA Championship of 1969 and third places one to third meant you were able to qualify for the interzonal to play for the World Chess Championship. So what is the move here which Pal Benko played? Can you guess it? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, he played bishop a6. And this is crushing. If the queen moves, queen takes g2, mate. What can white do? Can't do anything here. So it's enough just to make like this, for example. Okay, if he puts the bishop in the way, we just, just take it's not nothing. So that was a totally disastrous isolated queen's pawn game, in fact. Uh, okay, so so what happened then? In particular, so Pal Benko, the top three fi finishers, including Pal Benko, Sammy Rozevsky and William Addison, they all qualified for the 1970 interzonal in Palma de Mallorca, Mallorca, pardon me, by failing to play in this US Championship, Bobby Fischer apparently gave up all hope of playing in the 1972 World Championship, to which the interzonal was the first stepping stone. And there's a brilliant page uh, by someone on this, which I'll put in the link in the description of the video, which has the full cross table for this event and all the details very, very amusing uh, tell about this. Basically, uh, we saw the 1959 uh, candidates tournament. We saw evidence of the Russians ganging up on Fisher's Kara Khan. And later, there were other candidates uh, tournaments where Fisher didn't really uh, do well. And in fact, In the 1962 candidates, Fisher was a heavy favourite. 
and um, basically uh, he didn't do very well in 1962 had a big setback wanted a complete restructuring of the entire candidate system from the all play alls yeah, uh, to a knockout system Fisher granted the request for the 1965 candidates but Fisher refused to play in that in the next cycle he began playing for the 1967 interzonal but withdrew from that so three entire cycles were lost two of them without trying and this was the fourth one this was the US championship which Fisher should have played in it had great strategic importance compared to the others but it was the generosity of Pal Benko he gave up his place and this is not very well documented until recently until now Chessbase have highlighted this that he gave up his place for the uh, interzonal what did Pal Benko say in the recent chess base articles he said he modestly refers to it, this event as the most logical gesture he could make it gesture he could make at the time he says quote my own chess career was nearing its end while Fisher was very young very strong and ambitious and I knew he would do well and earn the right to compete for the world title which Fisher of course did that in 1972 for the most dramatic world championship in chess history he beats Baski to become world chess champion but we can argue that this was Hal Benko's greatest gambit this offering to Fisher of his place comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much